So verse 3, Paul writes, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's a short, short verse, short passage. Um, one that you're used to hearing from me, like when I begin a sermon. So, you know, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this, today's sermon comes from blah, blah, blah. You know, you'll hear me say that in a regular sermon on any given Sunday. And, and uh, you know, I suppose it gets to be really easy for us to hear. It sort of rolls off the tongue from me even. And um, we never really think about the true meaning that stands behind all of it. So I want to maybe unpack it a little bit if we can. Um, Paul uses this as sort of a, a prayer you know, to begin his letter to the people. So he's praying that God's grace and peace would be among the people that comes from God and Christ. But it's also um, an opening line or a greeting. So think about like when you write a, when you write a letter to someone. I, I maybe tend to get stuff, stuff like this a little more frequently than, than others just because I work with pastors and people in the ministry that will typically start off a letter like this. So, you know, dear Reverend McReynolds, grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ, or, you know, Lenten greetings from so-and-so. Uh, we always have some sort of an introductory um, phrase that we'll put at the beginning of a letter. Um, Paul's is unique, I suppose, in that um, it's a prayer uh, it's a prayer that he's praying that we would receive God's grace, that we would receive God's peace, but it also serves as this greeting. So it sort of serves a dual function. Um, I would say the same is true for, uh, you know, when you hear me do this at the beginning of a, a sermon. Uh, grace to you and peace. So it's a prayer that you would receive God's grace during the course of this sermon, which is law gospel preaching. Um, so you in the law, you'd be broken as a sinner in... In the gospel, you would be um, re revived by, you know, revivified, have life put back into you by Christ, um, because that's the purpose of a sermon. This is why we don't let anybody just preach. You know, a called and ordained servant of the word who's properly studied and become licensed to preach is one who preaches now and fulfills the office of holy ministry because the power of God's word wielded from the pulpit is a power to kill and to make alive. So the law that's proclaimed, that's preached, kills people. The gospel, which is proclaimed, makes alive again. And um, that being made alive, that state of being made alive is a, is a matter of being, uh, living in a state of grace. Um, with that, you know, let's break down the words a little bit here. Uh, grace comes from a Greek word, um, charis. Charis, uh, is, uh, is the word for grace, and um, we recognize that we live in a state of grace, um, that we're currently living in a state of grace. We're forgiven because of what Christ has done for us, and, um, and we receive God's grace and mercy because of it. Uh, I'll give you an example of this grace from the catechism here um, you know, to remind you a little bit of some of this. This comes from um, the Apostles' Creed. And I think it's a good reminder for us, even given now, you know, like the time that we find ourselves in, um, where we stay at the first article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures. He's given me my body and soul and eyes and ears and all my members and my reason and all my senses, and he still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all that I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. I'm going to set that aside because we'll come back to some of that stuff. But, but listen to the, the things that God... Um, showers upon us in grace, letting us live in this state of grace. He gives us house and home, food and drink, clothing and shoes, wife and children, land, animals, all that I have, um, breath in my lungs, the beat of my heart. There's nothing that I have, and this actually comes later in 1 Corinthians 4, um, what do you have that you didn't receive and why do you boast as though you didn't receive it? We have everything because God first gave it to us um, 
out of his gracious disposition towards us. Um, there's another important feature about grace that, that we easily ignore. We think, oh, well, God shows grace to his Christian people. Uh, God shows grace to all creation, right? He sent Jesus to redeem creation, of which man and woman, you know, in, from Genesis 1 and 2, man and woman are the pinnacle of God's creation. We're the, we're the top of the chain and everything else in creation flows out from us because we were the last, the last piece of the puzzle that God was building in all of creation. So we're sort of, you know, made in his image to have dominion over everything in his image. And um, all of creation lives under this grace first shown to man and woman that flows out even from there down to everything that's counted in all creation. So everything that all of us have, not just men and women, but everything that all of us have, we have because God shows us grace. And that includes Christians in the church, but it also includes those who are outside of the church. And um, by way of um, giving an example on this, I'm going to share with you a parable that Jesus gave in in, uh, Matthew 13. This starts at verse 24. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared also, and the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers. Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Uh, I think that's a perfect example of, of grace, that God, you know, he allows people that are not even a part of his, his fold, if you will, they're not a part of the Christian church, to prosper, to grow along with those who are, which is the wheat in the parable. So the weeds are his enemies, the wheat are his people, and he allows them to grow together. And if you pull one out, then you pull both out. Anybody that's ever done any gardening knows that. So he allows both to grow together, and when will the time come when the harvest um, occurs? That's an important thing for us to to sort of pay attention to. There's still time. We're we're living right now, you know, in in the state of... Self quarantine, COVID nineteen, you know, coronavirus, all that stuff. Um, I'd seen an article on this the other day in the news about you know how uh, swarms of locusts are forming in Africa at several different locations and Egypt and you know the, the signs of the end times are all around us, folks. The signs of the end times have been around us for a long time, as long as I've been alive, and and they're getting louder and louder, you know to try and draw our attention because it is difficult to draw our attention. But um, the fact that they're getting louder should cause us to be reminded of who the one true God is and turn to repent. Metanoeo is the Greek word, to turn away from our sin and go in the opposite direction. These signs are loud and clear and we're living in a state of grace, but there will come a time when God's grace ends. When he's, when he's done showing us his grace and he's going to call an end to all this, you know, the, the trumpet will blast, according to 1 Thessalonians 4. Christ will return and, and um, he'll put an end to this current state of affairs that we're living in, which includes a state of grace. But the, the point I'm making with this is that there are people, you know, who will not be counted a part of the kingdom in that moment. And those are the ones with whom we should be or for whom we should be concerned about and, um, and pursuant of. Someone exposed each of us to God's grace. We live in it now, so then it becomes incumbent upon us to share that same grace with someone else. Not because by doing the work it saves us, but, but because it was first shown to us. We do it because we love because we've been first loved. Uh, there's grace. So we've talked a little bit about grace. Let's talk to you. Um, grace to you and peace. So peace, the, the Greek word is irene. Uh, the, it, it really, you'd be more familiar with the Hebrew word that gives um, 
uh, what peace is. Peace is shalom. Shalom. You know, um, sit around the campfire and I'll strum my guitar and we'll sing songs of shalom with one another. Um, shalom comes from God and we can be at peace because we live in a state of grace. So shalom, I would say, flows from grace. We can sit comfortably at peace, uh, at ease in the middle of a, a churning, turning, turmoil-filled world um, because we have God's grace, because we live as his children um, and we have knowledge of this. Well, that knowledge gives to us peace, right? Uh, I've said this at the beginning of all this um, COVID-19 stuff that, you know, in 1 John it teaches that perfect love drives out all fear. And Jesus is the manifestation of God's perfect love for humanity. God sent Jesus to stand in humanity's place to receive the punishment for sin. So humanity is off the hook because of what Jesus did for our sins. That doesn't mean we should go on sinning so that Christ's grace may increase. That's Romans 1. By no means should we go on sinning so that Christ's grace continues to increase. We should stop sinning. But the sin that is in us, original sin, inherent sin, but also actual sin that we will still um, engage in, that's been forgiven. Because it's been forgiven, my sins have been removed from me. Now my sins no longer divide me from God, and now I can be one again with God on account of what Christ has done. Because I don't have to fear God's wrath and punishment for my sin, because he, he meted that out on Jesus, because I don't need to fear it, I'm free. Which means, um, because I'm free, I can live in a state of peace and bliss. Uh, you know, I've said it before, my, my, um, I need to come up with some new metaphors because Teflon, nobody knows what Teflon is anymore, but, you know, I always say I'm Teflon, it just rolls off me. Nothing affects me. I mean, you don't like what I'm preaching, you don't like what I'm teaching, I, I can't do anything about that. I, I hope you would receive this, because it's not my word, it's Christ's word, um, it, but if you don't like me or don't like what I'm saying here because of it, uh, it's pretty much water off my back like I'm Teflon, um, because it, that's, I don't need to worry about that. What I need to worry about is what does God think in this whole thing? And I have peace um, from God because I live in a state of grace. And, and I think that's the important part that comes from peace. That's the gospel induced peace, if you want to call it that. Um, let's go to the next piece. Uh, it says from God, our father, uh, you know, there's been movements and talk about this. I don't, in a men's Bible study, which is the context that this we're doing here is, um, God, you know, we can relate to what does a father do. Um, there's been movements to try and, you know, in, an, in a hyper-sexualized society to sort of put a different cast on who God is. You know, God, we should refer to him as our mother because if God really loves us, well, mothers are more nurturing and loving and caring and if that's sort of the, the part of God that we want to convey, then we, we should refer to God as our mother. No, um, scripture does not reveal to us, scripture reveals God to us, and it doesn't reveal him as our mother. In fact, it very much reveals him as our father. If, if I return to the catechism for a second, what does it say? Um, God has made me all creatures. Um, he's given me all that I have. But it's that last piece. He defends me against danger. He guards and protects me from all evil. That's a nurturing thing that, that you know, even a woman figure can do. I understand. But then Luther goes on to write, all this he does out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy without merit or worthiness in me. Um, he does it out of a fatherly goodness and divine mercy because men, I think, would resonate with some of this. At least it, it makes sense to me. Um, while I can appreciate those gifts that a woman can give, her um, ability to maybe um, nurture, care, um, raise, even from the time of infants, you know, where men sort of get maybe sometimes a little more impatient. Um, they don't deal with some of that stuff. Um, men carry this sense of responsibility. I'm not saying women don't. I'm saying that men understand this. You know, that we have to sometimes make unpopular decisions um, as the heads of our households. Um, it means we have to take into account 
all the things that are going on, all the opinions that people have, and then we need to make the decision on behalf of that household that uh, may make some people unhappy. But And it's a burden of responsibility that's been placed on us as the head of the household, um, as God has deemed us. Um, you know, that's part of our dominion that he's given to us, is that the man would be the head of the woman, um, that the woman would submit to the husband, because in that form of a relationship, this is Ephesians 5, by the way, verses 22 to 33, if you want to check it out. I'm not going to read through that now, but Christ says, or excuse me, Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, that the husband is the head of the bride, just as Christ is the head of his bride, the church. And the church submits to Christ, just as the bride submits to the husband. And fourth commandment, the children submit to the man and the woman who are the husband and the wife, the parents, their authorities that God's given to the children. So there's this order that God has built into his creation, and it begins with the head of the household, who's the man. But who's the man in subjection under? The man is in subjection under God the Father. So there's still an ordering in creation that flows from the top down. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the angels, archangels, all the company of heaven, down to the earthly realm, to the husband, father, head of the household, to the wife who's in submission to the husband, to the children who are in submission to them, to the animals, the, the pets and the fish and the, you know, fill in the blank. This order of creation reflects um, God's design. Now, we, we've gone outside of the order of creation. We've done things our own way, and there's mixed up stuff as a result of sin, and we don't oftentimes see this order. But if we look to God's word, it reveals to us this ordering, and, and we should adhere to this ordering because it's the way God designed it to be. As such, that leaves the man then in the earthly side of things as the head of his household. And how does the man work? He should work in the fear and reverence of the Lord. So the man should look to the Lord, God's word, for his direction. Um, therefore, you know, what we should do as men is, is that should direct our, our daily living. You know, if my kids want to play in a softball tournament on Sunday morning when God's word is being proclaimed, then I am the man, head of the household, who has that God-given duty to lead and guide my household in the direction that it should go. Um, just as God the Father has directed us. That's not popular. That's not oftentimes the way people do things. Um, if it means, you know, I want to go to the races or I want to, you know, go camping on the weekend or I want to be out on the, you know, the hunting blind or fishing or doing whatever it is that I do, working on the car because I only get so many days off to do that. Well, you know, God says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. And then he puts that burden on the man to, to, convey it to his household and all creation that the man has been given dominion under or over excuse me and uh it all flows from god the father at the top and when we don't do it we're going to be held in account for it um, god is going to look after us and call us to account for it and god is not you know this comes from a fatherly position and then he puts that burden on us as men um, as fathers and as husbands and as leaders in our households and in our, in our communities um, to uphold the way God has uh, determined that things need to be done. Jesus was a perfect example of this. Jesus said, you know, I could do nothing that's not the will of the Father. Um, he had to do whatever the will of the Father was because he was in subjection um, under the Father to do what the Father had sent him to do. And so he would become for us our, our leader, our example which I think that's a nice transition into the next piece here, is that, that uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the, word, the Greek word for Lord is kurios. Kurios, you know from like kyrie, kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, which we've been praying a lot lately here, but uh, Lord come near um, and show us your mercy, which is sort of similar or akin to grace and peace like we get at the beginning of this. But I want to talk about just that word uh, Lord for a minute. Uh, Lord, this kurios is something that we all sort of uh, agree that Jesus is Lord. Um, you see it on signs on the interstate and stuff like that. Jesus is Lord. Um, in the context of 1 Corinthians, remember that this whole book is written around conflict, separations or divisions. 
And um, with these separations or divisions that exist, Paul seeks in writing this letter, First and Second Corinthians, um, to to um, dispel the divisions, to bring people back together. You know, it no longer do I follow Paul, I follow Christ, I follow Apollos. You know, but now we all live under the head who is Christ. We seek to grow up into the head who is Christ. And there's only one leader, right? It's not Paul. It's not Apollos. It's not. And so these divisions that exist, you know, in all these different realms, they need to be brought together. And that's what this letter seeks to do. Well, let's talk about our current context. Um, you've got lots of divisions. You know, there are denominational di- di- divisions, you know, amongst the church. So... You've got, you know, the Episcopal, Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, and within the Lutherans, there's ELCA and Wells and Missouri Synod, and and um, you know, there's all these different divisions that all exist. And what's the, you know, how can we say that the church is still one? How can we still say that all these people are are in Christ? They're all Christian. Well, generally, we look for the lowest common denominator because there's things that divide us on all these different levels. Well, they've got different communion practice. They've got different views towards baptism. They've got different views about what Jesus says here. They've got different views about what is sin and what isn't sin. They've got different views about homosexuality. They've got different views about divorce or you know, fill in the blank. All of our views, hear me loud and clear, all of our views should be shaped from the top who is God who expresses them through Jesus Christ in the power of his Holy Spirit down through his word that is discerned and dispelled you know, in that order of creation that God gives it. We like to say, you know, what makes us all uni- united is that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. That's the common, lowest common denominator amongst all the different denominations that exist out there. Well, if Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, it includes the word Lord, Kyrios. He's our master. As our master, we're in subjection under him, right? He is above us. We are beneath him. This fits order of creation. Our Lord is one who is the master over us. If we don't like what our Lord has to say, then we ignore it and we raise ourselves up either on the same level as our Lord or even above it. Now think about the first sin that Adam and Eve committed. They wanted to be not beneath God, don't eat the fruit of the tree, that neither shall you touch it lest you die. That was God's direction to them. They wanted to be like God, on the same level as God, right? Knowing good from evil or even above God to determine, hey, we want to do our thing our own way. We don't want to listen to you, God. We're in charge here. That's the first sin. And really, that's what divides us, even, um, I would tell you, as denominations, because it's all on the basis of, well, we believe that this is what the church teaches, or we believe this is what the church teaches, or we've got differences on all these different things. Uh, If Jesus is truly your Lord, well, from John 1.1, I'm not going to look it up here, but you guys can look it up. John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word, the Bible, the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then if you look at John 1, 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and made his dwelling among us. What John is talking about is Jesus Christ is the Word. Well, if Jesus Christ is the Word, where does our doctrine that divides us from all these other different church bodies come from. It comes from the Word. And who is the Word? It is Jesus. So when we adhere to the Word, when we put ourselves in subjection under the Word, a la Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, we are the church who is in subjection under the Word that's coming from Christ, then we are truly the church because we're acting according to the Word. That gives us the basis to discuss our differences with other churches, right? Or even amongst ourselves, not even other church bodies. We have our practices, our doctrine, our teaching comes from the word. Doctrine is not man-made. Doctrine is God-given, right? And doctrine comes from the word. So our doctrine, our our uh, teaching on the Lord's Supper comes from 1 Corinthians, doctrine, which is the Lord's word. Our teaching on baptism 
comes from Acts chapter 2, from Matthew 28, um, you know, numerous places in baptismal theology. Um, our teaching on the office of the ministry, uh, law and gospel, um, creation, uh, love for neighbor, uh, Ten Commandments. What is sin? What isn't sin? You name it. Where does it come from? It comes from the Word. We don't get to be the determinant of what is or what isn't sin. We don't get to be the ones that decide this stuff because the Word has done it. Um, that brings me back to our catechism real quick. As I said, I'd keep mentioning to it. If you look in the, in the new catechism, one of the things that we use this tool for is teaching you know, new members of the church, people that are coming into the church, or new catechumens who've been baptized, and we look to confirm them. Well, we've taken great pains in the explanation portion of our catechism in the back here, that whenever we, whenever we state what is our doctrine or teaching on any of these six chief parts, then we back it up with all kinds of Bible passages that back it up. And you, I hope you see what we're doing there is that the Word is guiding our, our teaching and our doctrine. We're not making this stuff up but it's coming from the word. And if it comes from the word, then it means it's coming from God and it means we're following that order of creation and we're just teaching according to what God's word says, not what we want to do. And I'll go a step further because I got a, a hymnal sitting right here on my desk that you can't see. Even our liturgy follows those forms because our liturgy comes from the word. Instead of us making up liturgies, we have elements in the divine service that come right out of the word and so if it comes from the word then it's from god and and it is good to use it in this sense we should use it for worship we should use it for doctrine we should use it you know uh, in light of our differences between denominations we should use it as the the place where we talk about our differences and i, and I believe we do um why do we proclaim the 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 theology that we do surrounding the Lord's Supper and we have closed communion as a church body because that's what's proclaimed in God's word, 1 Corinthians 11. Um, you know, I, I'm comfortable with that stuff. But it really boils down to who is your Lord? If you don't like what, what it says in the word, then you're disagreeing with the Lord Jesus Christ because this is his word and he is the word. And if our doctrine is on the foundation and on the basis of this word, then your problem isn't with you know, the teachers of this doctrine. Your problem is with the word itself. And um, the Lord will judge. He will discern between those who have been in subjection under his word and those who put themselves over this word. And, and we should live a, in constant um, state of repentance for our, our going around God's word. So for men, you know, we have to follow a word that's a hard word to follow. It's not easy to, to do what this word says. That's why it doesn't say, you know, take up your, you know, take up your uh, bunch of grapes and be fed them while you're fan laying, reclining on a chair in front of a nice beach serene scene and follow me. No, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. And a cross is an instrument of death and suffering and difficulty. Um, and, and for us, it is difficult to go outside of ourselves and what we want and instead to put ourselves in subjection under Christ and his word who is under God the Father and his word. So a um, lot to unpack in there. You know, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We can only live in this state of grace and have peace because God first gives it to us and the way that he gives it to us is through Jesus who is our Lord and our Master. And what has our Lord and our Master done for us, his subjects? He has given himself totally, fully, freely, so that we can enjoy this grace and peace. A lot of stuff, I get it, um, but uh, and probably lots that I've missed, but we're going to leave it at that. Be sure to join us again. We'll just keep doing our uh, men's Bible study from online like this until, uh, until we get a chance to get back together in person. So glad to have you join us today and uh, hope you can come back again. Thanks, Pastor.